Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Ryan Davis, and I am a junior studying economics here at the college. I'm also the chair of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please congregate, or please exit, go walk to the exit closest to you, and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag AIPolicyForum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Dr. Jason Matheny and tonight's moderator, Eric Rosenbach. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Eric Rosenbach, as you heard. This is Jason Matheny, the director of IARPA, which is the Intelligence Advanced Research Activity. That's close enough. Uh, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to cut right to the chase here. Tonight, we're going to talk about AI and public policy, which, as you all know, is a big topic not only at the Kennedy School, uh, but in the real world and also in the intelligence uh, community. So we're very lucky to have Jason here. Um, this is a smart guy. You can read his bio and see that even in the hallowed halls of Harvard, this is someone who can probably out degree, degree for degree, almost anyone here. Uh, he also is a thoughtful guy. You know, there's not always a strong correlation between people who have lots of degrees being actually thoughtful in this case. Uh, that's true. And Jason, also, he's a good guy. So that's what we look for most <laughs> uh, when we're trying to bring in good guests is people who are smart, they're thoughtful, and they're also good people. And what we'd like to do, um, because Jason, in his position at IARPA, has a lot of exposure to AI, machine learning, and the nexus of that and national security, um, have a conversation with him. I'm gonna start and ask him a couple questions. We'll do that for about the first 30 or 35 minutes. And then I'll go out to y'all in the audience uh, and let you ask some questions too. Um, so for starters, Jason, since uh, I can't remember exactly what the acronym for IARPA stands for, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. What is, a, what is IARPA? It's not a DARPA. Yeah. What is it, and, and what are you doing on a daily basis as we, the director? We, we do rhyme, so <laughs> we've got that down. Um, uh, so first, it, it really is such a pleasure being here. Um, I think uh, the work that you all are doing here makes us smarter within government. Um, when you're critical of uh, the kinds of policy choices that are made, when you're thoughtful about what we could be doing that we're not already doing, uh, you make us smarter and wiser, um, and we're grateful for that. Um, I really do deeply value these kinds of uh, engagements, and it's also just a personal privilege to be up here with uh, a national hero and somebody who really has set an example, not only for um, for national service, but for being a good human being. Thank that's you, that's important sense. to us, too. You already, you already got your forum spot, so you don't have to like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I want to be invited back. Uh, so... Um, so IARPA is an organization that funds advanced research for national intelligence. We fund uh, basic and applied research at over 500 uh, universities, colleges, companies, national labs. Uh, and most of that work is done unclassified, in the open, uh, as level playing field competitions. We sort of run research tournaments. Uh, and we fund work uh, as diverse as uh, applied research in mathematics, computer science, physics, chemistry, biology, neuroscience. We fund a large amount of work in social sciences, understanding how uh, human analysts can make errors in judgment, how they can avoid those errors. Um, and we uh, fund work in political science uh, and sociology, uh, even anthropology. Uh, so we have one of the most diverse portfolios, I think, of, of any federal R&D organization. Um, but that work uh, only succeeds because we fund uh, places like Harvard to actually solve our hardest problems for us. Um, we don't have any researchers in-house. In fact, if you come and visit IRPA, it's sort of a letdown because you, 
you sort of imagine that you're visiting like Q Branch from the James Bond movies, yeah. and that so will have. You're not doing the weaponized watches. They're on. No weaponized anything. watches. We outsource all of that to Harvard. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's in a deep corner of the Belfer Center. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, they're all Timexes from like circa 1983 to yeah. the big calculator watch yeah. versions. Ash Carter has one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, the work that we do is, um, uh, is really focused on trying to understand uh, how we can make better intelligence judgments about a very complex world faster uh, and in a way that's more accurate. Uh, and that means then that we need to have better methods of collecting data, better methods of analyzing data, uh, better methods of assessing the veracity of data, uh, which has led to fairly large investments in AI, the topic for tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so one of the things we want to do in the forum is also educate people and have them actually understand what some things mean. Um, when you hear about AI and machine learning, it's sometimes hard to understand what that actually is. So in my class, I like to um, make students break things down by their component parts. Break down AI and machine learning, like what does that actually mean? Maybe what's the difference and what are the component parts? Yeah, so AI is a, a broader category than machine learning. Um, and uh, AI uh, really is a set of techniques that could be used to, uh, to allow a machine to mimic or replicate some aspects of human cognition or animal cognition. Um, so the ability to reason, uh, plan, act autonomously, uh, make inferences, make judgments. Um, AI can be separated into things like expert systems, which are rule-based, sort of if this, then do that, um, or robotics. Um, but then there's a subset of, of AI called machine learning, uh, which is really focused on developing systems that learn uh, based on available data or the experience of a system. And there are a few different components to being able to do that kind of learning. First, you need to have an algorithm or a model um, you need to have data uh, from which to learn, and then you need to have computing. Um, with those three elements, you're able to achieve a number of fairly powerful um, performance um, uh, milestones. Um, and just at recently, in the last several years, um, there's been a, a lot of low-hanging fruit in machine learning that's been plucked, uh, really owing to techniques that were developed about 25 years ago. Uh, so a whole family of machine learning techniques called deep learning or deep neural nets uh, has proven remarkably powerful when you have uh, large volumes of data, when you have uh, plentiful and cheap computing, uh, and when you have some algorithms that, um, that really haven't changed all that much in the last 25 years, but with, uh, with some modifications have proven quite powerful. So a number of very hard problems uh, in machine learning have been solved over a short period of time, just within, say, the last uh, six years. I think really the major milestone was uh, image classifiers being applied to something called ImageNet and proving that these deep learning techniques uh, could achieve human levels of performance uh, uh, very quickly. So if uh, you follow one line of a philosophical debate, it would be whether it's the algorithm that matters more and having a great algorithm or having great data. And what you just said about the idea of the algorithms themselves not actually evolving that much over the last 25 years, maybe some of the same models that uh, some of the Kennedy School students use, is it that the data and the availability of data has become more abundant or that the algorithms are getting better and which really matters more if you have to make a final call on it? Yeah, and I think, um, and, and I think computer scientists will probably be irritated by my saying that we haven't made so many fundamental advances <laughs> in algorithms over the last two decades. Um, I mean, there are some important classes of, of new work in um, generative adversarial networks and reinforcement learning that really um, are uh, fundamental. Uh, but at the same time, I think we've seen the greatest gains of improvement in the availability of uh, high quality labeled data and in computing. Mm -hmm. um, computing especially, we've, uh, we've seen what's sometimes called Moore's Law, this um, improvement in uh, performance per unit cost uh, that tends to uh, double uh, every one to two years and has historically for quite a long time. Uh, but um, 
I think if one were to break down in the most significant applications of machine learning, say in image classification, speech recognition, machine translation, um, navigation, uh, it's, it's a pretty even trade-off between data and compute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he decided not to give a clear answer. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's a, we'll we'll that a, start pressing on the Is that a time-honored tradition? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. If you were my student, I would nail you down any further, but we'll, we'll get down to some of the hard policy questions here. Um, when you're the director of IARPA, <clears throat> who's your boss? How do you decide what investments you're going to make? And in AI in particular, do you follow the lead of the director of national intelligence or the secretary of defense? How do you decide what you're going to do? Uh, so we're given uh, quite a lot of latitude. Specifically in AI. Too. Yeah, uh, we're, um, we're given quite a lot of latitude to be thinking over the horizon about challenges that may not yet be a national intelligence priority, uh, that may not be a, um, a crisis uh, yet, uh, but would represent a deep challenge, say, in 10 years to national intelligence or an opportunity in 10 years. Uh, because research that we fund takes at least five years to pay off, uh, and very often as much as 10 years. So for example, we're funding a lot of work in quantum computing, mm -hmm. uh, for which we're probably the largest uh, funder of academic research. Uh, we fund a lot of work in superconducting computing, uh, which has applications that will really pay off probably in five to 10 years. Uh, and I think many of the investments that we're making in machine learning uh, will really be paying off on the 10-year time scale. For instance, we have a program called Microns that's aiming to understand how animal brains actually learn from data, which is very different from the way that machines currently using machine learning learn from data. Uh, we know that there are these rep repeated circuits within the brains of animals uh, within the neocortex uh, that learn from very small data sets, which is very different from the way that most machine learning uh, is is used today where you require thousands of examples um, and yet you know most toddlers do not need to see a thousand examples of a chair to recognize what a chair is how is it that they're able to be so efficient that's not a that's not a crisis right we don't we don't we're not suffering from a problem of like achieving toddler parity uh, in machine learning uh, but it's a fundamental problem that for us to make progress in machine learning we really need to take some uh, more inspiration from how animals learn Okay, so it's not an operational type organization where you may get a call one day from the White House National Security staff and they say, we need an answer in a month on how we can use AI to conduct better surveillance of video cameras across the United States. No, we're, we're, the, we're the place where you, you would call if you want to understand sort of what is the research landscape look like, what's the state of technology in the laboratory. Uh, we help on that side uh, so that decision makers can get, um, can get wiser about what's actually happening in, in science and technology. Uh, but our programs take so long to run that if somebody wants a solution next month to a problem, mm -hmm. it's going to take us a month just to award the grant to Harvard to start working on that problem. Yeah. Although uh, we're the fastest, I'm sure. So. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you know, there's always a question about uh, when you're doing work a on AI, and in your case in particular, whether you're trying to find something that would replace a human or augment a human in making uh, a decision. And in the intelligence context, this is a pretty big question too, because I remember even when I was an Army intelligence officer, and this is a long time ago, I was in charge of a signals intelligence unit that collected telephone calls and email. We were both doing it for... Yugoslavia, but also trying to collect on Bin Laden back then. And it was interesting because the, the linguists were led to believe that within two years, they would no longer have a job because there was some AI mechanism that would go through all these voice cuts, mm -hmm. transcribe it, and immediately spit out a report. That obviously didn't happen because that was almost 20 years ago now. But talk to me, Jason, about the focus now in the Intel community, whether analysts, linguists, data, and is it the objective to replace intelligence analysts and operators in some way or augment it? Focus is definitely on augmenting. I think we're, we're a long way from replacing human analysts. Uh, so really the goal is to uh, reduce the amount of data that an analyst needs to look at in order to make a judgment. Um, and one of, those, um, one of those steps to data reduction is to be constantly scouring sort of the data environment for signs that might be important 
and then kind of perform like analytic triage for the analyst so that you present the things that are uh, that are sort of balanced. This could be important or it might not be important. Tee it up. Uh, to give one example, we have a, a program uh, called Open Source Indicators that looked at many different kinds of unclassified data for indicators of disease outbreaks. And uh, um, one of the real challenges um, for detecting outbreaks overseas is medical reporting isn't very good. It's spotty. So we were looking for ways of detecting earlier whether there was a hemorrhagic fever outbreak, like Ebola. Uh, and some of the early indicators are uh, people staying at home rather than going to work and back. So absenteeism. One way to detect absenteeism is if mobile phones stay at home rather than going to work and back. And you don't need personal level data, you just need like population level data of phones staying in one place during a work day. Um, but you could also look at whether there was an increase in crowding at certain pharmacies or health clinics from commercial overhead imagery. Uh, you could look at whether there was increased web search queries for symptoms for people trying to understand uh, what they might be suffering from, um, or from social media messages that were posting their symptoms. Uh, the volume of data that was involved in making those kinds of judgments uh, was, you know, trillions of bits. Um, too much for any human analyst uh, to inspect. So we trained systems that could automatically look through these data. We trained them on historical disease outbreaks in order to identify those patterns of behavior that indicated whether an outbreak was taking place. And we could then get um, outbreak detection that happened weeks faster than traditional medical surveillance. Uh, so that's the kind of problem that I think machine learning is really well suited for, is taking the ocean of data uh, and bringing it down into something about the size of a kiddie pool that an analyst can make sense of, uh, actually really dig down into in order to understand whether there's a real event happening or whether this is an artifact from noisy data. Hmm. What, what are the areas that the Intel community itself is most interested in gaining the, the leverage and the assistance of AI-enabled tools? I think uh, imagery. Uh, so we have a, a program called uh, Finder, uh, that takes an image uh, that might be from, say, a cell phone camera uh, or from a ground-based uh, uh, camera, uh, and even if that image is not natively geotagged by like a GPS uh, with a latitude or longitude, uh, the system automatically detects where on earth the picture was taken just by looking at features like uh, the skyline, uh, the architectural features, geologic features, botanical features. Uh, so automated geolocation in a way that that would be impossible for human analysts to look at a picture of you know an, a, a random spot in Afghanistan and figure out where that was taken mm -hmm. um, and that's that's led to some really important um, operational successes uh, another example is machine translation and speech recognition in any language uh, so most of the big internet companies that invest in machine translation or speech to text uh, are really interested in languages where there are lots of consumers, right? Because that's, that's where the market is. Uh, in intelligence, we have to worry about all those other languages too. Uh, so we have a, a program called Babel and one called Material uh, that work on speech recognition and machine translation for any language uh, and bringing training time down to a week from probably about nine to 12 months was the norm before this program. So getting about a two order of magnitude improvement uh, in performance. Um, and that's because there are these, you know, highly conserved features of language that we can use to train models. Um, a fourth one I would say um, is being able to infer from imagery uh, what the function of a building is um, from satellites. So can you tell whether a particular building is a bomb factory or an automotive plant? Can you label the features of the world in ways that are useful to intelligence analysts? Impossible to do manually just because there are so many buildings on Earth. Uh, and being able to monitor those patterns of activity that can tell you whether something is a weapons plant or not uh, is, is too subtle, really, for a human analyst to keep eyeballs on all the time. And how good is the Intel community using these tools now? So all the examples you're giving right now, most are in use, I expect, right now. You're not divulging classified info, so it's not that. but. You know, like, how good are they? How much does it actually help? How many false positives? And then, um, 
I'm going to follow up on some of the public policy issues of all that data that you just talked about and ask a little bit about that. So. Yeah, so, so the biggest challenge is in picking a target for a research program uh, that's sufficiently hard that it would be valuable um, and not so hard that it would be impossible. Um, and what we found is that um, usually we underestimate uh, just how much the performance gains can be. That is, we pick a number that we think is just on the threshold of being impossible, and then we exceed it with some of these techniques. So for example, hmm. um, some of the speech recognition work, uh, I mean, you're looking at a hundredfold improvement over the state of the art uh, in existing uh, speech recognition systems. Uh, in our geolocation work, you're looking at about a hundred thousand fold improvement over comparable techniques. Hmm. Um, and doing those head-to-head -head comparisons, so you sort of like have a randomized control trial and you, yeah. you, test, you test your methods against either manual practice or against what the pre-existing state of the art is, so that you really do have a level playing field tournament. I think that's really key to getting analysts to see the value of these tools. The other challenge, though, is not so much technical but cultural. How do you make analysts uh, comfortable in using these tools? And for that, we found one of the biggest difficulties is baking into machine learning systems the need for explainability. Because it's not enough just to spit out a result. You actually need to say, here's the evidence for this result uh, that's come out of an algorithm. Mm -hmm. We have a, a program called uh, Mercury, uh, which is a program that looks at raw SIGINT, so raw intercepted communications. Um, for indicators of military mobilization or terrorism activity. Um, these are really high consequence events, high consequence intelligence judgments. The analysts will not trust the outputs unless they see what did the system find that led to an alert, uh, that led to a forecast of, of this activity. So we do two things. One is we actually run a forecasting tournament in which the research teams are predicting real events before they occur uh, which is a lot harder than predicting history, we found. We, we actually started these forecasting tournaments because we kept getting these like business pitches, basically, of people with PowerPoint slides saying, we could have predicted 9-11, trust us. Here's yeah. the PowerPoint <laughs> slide to prove it. All right. We ran our model backwards, and here's a big blip on 9-11. So we said that's, that's not going to work because we, we actually need to tell whether these systems work against events that aren't already in our data set. So we run a forecasting tournament to see, can these systems actually predict real military mobilization, real terrorism events from intercepted communications? And they can. Um, and for analysts to trust those forecasts, then we need them to be able to see the audit or the evidence trail. Uh, I think that's just as critical to making accurate forecasts as to be able to explain them. Yeah, I think it's fair to say, having spent almost every day for two and a half years with the Secretary of Defense, that any intel analyst who would come to ash carter and say my machine just told me that the russians are mobilizing on the western border of poland or going into the crimea without being able to explain the data why they think that where it all came from would be a very uncomfortable situation for that person that's right so you can see it helping but you still would want the human i think to be able to explain why and uh you know make sure it's there but so let's talk about another aspect of this uh you know, back when I was an intel officer and when I was doing oversight at NSA and Cybercom, the amount of data collected is enormous. But in those organizations, there are very strict rules on the collection of U.S. person data mm. for certain and even allied data. And, you know, a lot of training that goes into that. When you talk about what you just did in terms of the, I think you said, thousand-fold increase or even higher for geolocational data and doing terrain yeah, or voice 000. recognition, yeah. What's baked into the algorithm to try to protect against collection on a U.S. person? And, and how do you deal with that even when you're talking about research assignments for someone up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they're trying to design that? Yeah, so maybe the best example of this is in, we had a, a program that looked at a lot of social media, and we didn't want to inadvertently include social media from U.S. persons. So first, um, we removed any social media that was in English, uh, and then we removed any social media that was uh, geolocated in uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so it, and we lost some performance probably because of that, right? Because there were some foreign social media messages that were in English, but That's we right. erred on the side of, of removing it yeah. um, rather than including it. 
Um, with, with our research, um, we do a civil liberties and privacy protection review for any research program that we fund, uh, in, in part to avoid things that, um, that really don't have a place in, in research to begin with uh, that ultimately is going to um, be based on foreign intelligence. Um, the other thing that we do is we invest a lot in privacy enhancing technologies. So um, we take uh, privacy really seriously, not only as a policy issue, but as a technology issue. We have a program called Hector, uh, which is focused on a new form of encryption, homomorphic encryption, uh, which can allow you to run queries that are encrypted against encrypted databases uh, so that you wouldn't have to give up personal details when all you need to know is how many people in this list have the flu or how many people in this list uh, you know, have uh, encephalitis. You don't need to know the names of the people. You just want the number of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a technology that could allow us to, as a society, balance uh, privacy with a lot of other security and public policy goals. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think is an example is we had a program called Aladdin, uh, which uh, goes through posted video. So it could be like videos on, um, on uh, people creating IEDs, like how-to videos, or martyrdom videos. It turns out that uh, when people post these kinds of videos as part of a terrorist activity, um, they don't tag their videos, right? They don't say, this is a martyrdom video. They don't tag it saying this is an IED how-to video. Instead, they post the video, they send the URL uh, out to their colleagues. We wanted to be able to detect the posting of these videos automatically. There are not enough human eyeballs on Earth to monitor all of the posted video. So we had to develop tools that can automatically characterize uh, that video um, and tell whether this is a video that's about a terrorist activity. As part of that, though, we wanted to ensure that we weren't inadvertently collecting on U.S. persons. So we made sure, again, that the origin of these videos was overseas, uh, that there wasn't, uh, there wasn't personal content in the videos. Very often that's costly um, to do that kind of scrubbing, but it's worth it. Could a skeptic look at the research you're doing, in particular on the algorithm, if, like we talked about in the beginning, there's the algorithm, the data, and the computing power running it and say, well, you've got the algorithm, you've got the computing power, what you chose to control was the data set. Someone not as nice as you could take those two other things, put it up against a data set that's running on the United States and do something more nefarious. Do you worry yeah, about that? I do. Um, so I, I think all of us who work in, in research recognize that um, uh, these technologies that we create are all double-edged swords. Um, one of the questions that we ask ourselves before, before we fund any new research program is how could this technology be used against us, be used maliciously, and what can we do to prevent misuse? Can we insert intrinsic safeguards? Uh, can we insert security measures that prevent theft or reverse engineering? Um, and then we ask the question, under what conditions would you regret having created this technology? I think this is something um, we, sort of in the research areas, need to be thinking about, especially in, in things like AR and machine learning, also in the biosciences, uh, because there's risks. So how can you make investments that are safe, uh, that are reliable? Um, are, there, are there investments that you can make that are more defensive, um, that, it, that they enjoy an, a, um, an asymmetric advantage in being used defensively rather than offensively? Uh, such that you can steer us towards um, a, a state in which defense has the upper hand. Um, and we, we really try to align our research portfolio with that goal. Mm -hmm. um, so surveillance and AI is one tough public policy issue. Maintaining privacy, Fourth Amendment rights, all of those things that are a core part of the United States. Um, but when I was in the Department of Defense, we started to get a lot of questions about whether or not we were gonna use AI-enabled tools to allow the use of lethal force, mm. literally to take out a terrorist in a combat zone. Um, what are your thoughts about that? First, in terms of the state of the technology that would enable that, and then philosophically, what should Americans and democracies all around the world, what should they think about a question like that? 
Uh, so it's an important public policy debate. Um, and I think so some of the the advocates um, for uh, introducing more autonomy into weapon systems uh, note that humans, particularly under stress, uh, can make bad decisions about the use of lethal force. Um, opponents um, of autonomy or greater autonomy in weapon systems note, though, that there's a, a need for meaningful human control uh, over weapon systems. And I would, I would say, particularly given the state of machine learning, uh, that is a real need. Uh, the tools that exist uh, are generally not robust uh, to various kinds of spoofing, uh, to misinformation. Um, there's a class of, um, sort of tricks that can be played against ma machine learning systems called adversarial examples. And it's now a kind of favorite parlor trick among computer science undergrads of like, with how, mu how little effort can I fool the state-of-the-art image classifier into thinking that this picture of a tank is actually a picture of a school bus. Um, and it doesn't take much work. So I think we're, we're a long ways off from where I, at least, would be comfortable having a significant degree of automation and, say, targeting or uh, weapons decisions. I think uh, our Defense Department um, has been uh, pretty wise then about establishing policies uh, that prevent the automation uh, within that, um, uh, that targeting uh, uh, decision. Um, and I think much of that uh, owes to, the, to you and during the period that you were uh, helping to formulate policy. So if you don't mind, I'll turn around the question just a bit <laughs> yeah. and sort of ask, um, how do you think about this? And where do you think the world is likely to converge on an equilibrium, if it does, uh, with respect to lethal autonomy? Yeah, that's like the classic Socratic method, right? You turn it back <laughs> on the prof when there's a hard question. When, um, when we were working on this in the Pentagon, believe it or not to me, this was not a hard question at all. I mean, maybe this will sound over, overly simplistic, but I can barely get Siri to work to tell me like where the closest hamburger joint is, more or less rely on some fancy AI algorithm to make an informed decision about when to use lethal force. In particular, because you know when you're at the top of the pyramid in the Pentagon and you're making really sensitive decisions about when to do a strike and the times that it would matter most, the process for that is so rigorous, it's only approved by Secretary Carter, in some cases only by the president. And that's after a series of four different briefings in which you ask 100 hard questions and only then you would give the approval. The idea that there's gonna be you know, a machine and data and a fancy algorithm that does that based on facial recognition, geolocation and terrain and say, this is the right person, this is the right time, and the collateral damage estimate is correct too, you know, I'm gonna fire without approval, seems very far-fetched. For the United States, anyway, I can see how others would do it. Uh, so I think for us, it was an easy decision. We put that in policy more than anything just to kind of like put at ease the people who are very concerned that we are programming mm -hmm. drones with AI algorithms to like start going out and bombing people. Yeah. Um, but let's look at it from another perspective. You know, we're at the Kennedy School and it's a very international place. Um, do you think all other nations would have that same approach? And you see a lot about what others are doing too. Yeah. You know, what are things that concern you from what you see the rest of the world doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried. Um, I mean, I think that uh, other countries haven't demonstrated the same degree of uh, reservation um, about um, inserting autonomy into some very high stakes uh, military decisions. So uh, one public example is the perimeter system that's used by Russia for nuclear command and control, uh, which involves a high degree of automation. Um, and if there's ever a place where you would not want automation, it's in nuclear command and control. Um, so the, the notion that you could have a, a nuclear war that's, that started um, due to a series of errors, of computer errors, of sensor errors, uh, is, I think, um, one that uh, makes me anxious. Can you explain that a little bit more, just that system and the way it works? This is the unclassified stuff. Again, he's like far too wise to disclose classified information. From yeah. what we know in reading in the unclassified world, what is it that this, like, how does this work? Right, so I'll just quote Wikipedia. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
and there's a whole book, by the way, on, on the perimeter system called The Dead Hand by uh, David Hoffman. Um, the, the notion um, originally for developing a sort of uh, autonomous nuclear command and control system within Russia was that if decision makers felt like they had a very short time in which to make a decision about a second strike, a retaliatory strike, if they felt as though an attack were underway, uh, they might um, they might make really bad decisions. They might make decisions under uncertainty, under time pressure, uh, that in fact were based on bad information. So the original intent was, let's relieve the time pressure such that even if the Kremlin were destroyed in a nuclear attack, uh, there would be a retaliation that would be certain to occur. So through a set of, of ground sensors to detect uh, a nuclear attack in Russia, uh, there would then be a automated uh, retaliatory strike. Well, there's any number of ways that one could imagine that going wrong, right? Uh, whether it's a terrorist nuclear detonation or sensor error or computer error, uh, I mean, all of this is sort of the fodder for like half of the science fiction movies I've seen. Um, and, uh, and those movies usually don't end well. Um, so I, I think... Uh, I think the notion that we would have um, uh, autonomy in such critical systems seems like one that's that's worth more attention. I'm actually surprised by the degree to which you know this doesn't come up more frequently. Is not not just thinking about what what would we um, wish that other countries would avoid including into their lethal autonomous weapon systems, but also um, what are the stakes of those lethal autonomous weapon systems? There's certainly a continuum, uh, and I would say nuclear command and control is at you know, the right most part of that continuum where the most attention is needed. Mm. So this fall, in connection with uh, the Russian angle, President Putin said, artificial intelligence is the future not only of Russia, but of all mankind. And whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. To which Elon Musk responded, competition for AI superiority at the national level is most li the most likely cause for World War III. And he said, IMO, he was tweeting like, in his uh, modest opinion, I think. To which Mark Zuckerberg responded, Musk's AI doomsday rhetoric is pretty irresponsible. What do you think about all that? Who's right? <laughs> thanks, Zuckerberg, Eric. Thanks for the, Zuckerberg, thanks for the softball. Elon Musk, <laughs> or Vladimir Putin? <laughs> Is there a fourth option? Nope. <laughs> when you run the chair, you get a whole bunch of bad options to make people pick from. <laughs> Is that a framework to yeah. think about this? And, and what's your perspective on all this? So, so I think that there are, are reasons to be concerned about the vulnerabilities of machine learning systems uh, without getting too exotic. I mean, I worry less about Skynet and Terminator uh, than I do just sort of about like digital flubber. You know, just uh, mach machines that are programmed to do something um, and they're poorly specified because, uh, you know, the programmers made errors or because the sensor data going into the system was errorful. Uh, so I think uh, including autonomy in fairly high stakes uh, systems um, is something we should be very careful about. Um, and not just in uh, the area of of weapon systems. I mean, also in financial systems, also in power systems. Uh, I mean, we, we have examples of uh, algorithmic traders uh, run amok uh, in our financial system. We have uh, instances of power grids run amok uh, due to uh, automated forms of control. So we do, as I think, a, a, as a society, need to um, uh, become a bit wiser about what are the vulnerabilities of these systems before we deploy them uh, into networks that have high stakes. Um, I, I think that the long-term you know, trajectory of uh, these technologies offers enormous promise, right? I mean, benefits to healthcare uh, and being able to do more accurate and earlier diagnosis of disease benefits to accelerating the rate, rate of scientific innovation by automatically generating hypotheses and testing them uh, to see which are, have more explanatory power over data, uh, data at volumes that human scientists may not be able to, uh, to, to fully analyze. Uh, improvements in material science, in, uh, in biochemistry, um, in uh, autonomous transport, 
All, all of this has um, enormous upside potential for humanity. Um, but in order to navigate the various speed bumps along the way, I think being mindful of some of the safety and vulnerability and reliability uh, questions um, is something that is worth paying attention to. I mean, the thing that really actually kind of occupies um, a large part of where IARPA is investing um, in machine learning reliability uh, is making sure that our systems are robust to uh, human error, uh, to uh, intentional attack, so feeding misinformation to uh, a machine learning classifier, uh, a poisoning attack that uh, tries to compromise the data uh, that goes into a machine learning system. Um, and then the various kinds of challenges in cybersecurity, where you have different forms of automation uh, that are responding to cyber attacks. Uh, so we have a program called CAUSE, uh, which automatically detects and even forecasts cyber attacks based on chatter and uh, hacker forums, the market prices of malware that are traded on the black market, uh, sort of patterns of help desk tickets across an enterprise when your computer is acting wonky. Um, so looking at those kinds of trends, you want to be able to make the best possible judgment. But there is an arms race and that the cyber actors um, will be trying to mistrain your classifiers by throwing a whole bunch of uh, malware that has certain kinds of features mm -hmm. so that your classifiers start to train on those features and then send a different kind of malware that really has the payload that doesn't have that feature. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an extraordinary kind of like machine deception arms race that we're in. Uh, and I think this convergence of policy, of cybersecurity, uh, and machine learning computer science research will get uh, very busy over the next decade. That's a, a great way to transition to go into audience questions here in a second. Just that area of cyber and AI is a very rich field in and of itself. And hopefully some students here tonight get motivated by what you just talked about and the idea of deception for AI, which is the old classic military feint so that they, you then go in with the real cyber attack. I can see a whole thesis and line of books just written on that uh, in a cyber strategy perspective. But we do have a, a lot of really bright, motivated, uh, hardworking Kennedy School students here and students from around Cambridge too. What's your advice to them about how to get into this field and is it in the national security space, in the private sector? Where do you think it's most interesting? Where are the most interesting public policy questions? Uh, well, my, uh, my, my main advice is, is, to, is to try to find opportunities to work at the intersection of, of, uh, of policy and, and machine learning, uh, because right now there is nothing close to the pipeline of expertise uh, at that intersection that we'll need in the coming decades. So if you're, if you're looking for um, a future in policy and you're interested in machine learning, uh, I think you'll have lots of opportunities, whether it's in government and places like the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, or in Congress or in OMB, um, or it's, uh, it's in industry, helping industry to navigate uh, some of these very challenging policy issues. Uh, I think I'm really encouraged you know, that there are companies that, uh, that have uh, realized that this is a priority and, and have started to hire people who are at that intersection of computer science and, uh, and policy studies. Uh, and then lastly, in academia for, for think tanks uh, like Belfer to really start building that pipeline, uh, that generation of expertise that we'll need to make us smarter uh, and navigate some of the policy challenges that we'll have in the future. So whether you're a lawyer or a public policy scholar um, or a computer scientist, uh, or you're all three, um, we need you. That's good. Okay, well, that should get a lot of you motivated out there. Um, so why don't we do this? Now, I'd like to turn to questions from the audience. And for those of you who've been in the forum, you know how this works. Uh, if you could start by lining up at the microphones, and I'll call on questions as people come there. If you could please um, state your name, kind of tell us who you are very briefly, just so we know. And remember, what we're looking for here is a question not a speech. A question is an interrogative that ends with a question mark and usually is one sentence. If you need to set it up with one sentence, it's okay, but you know, we're just trying to get as much uh, interaction here as possible. 
Uh, so I'm looking around, and yes, sir, we'll go to you first. Um, hi, I'm Elliot of a math student here. Uh, you made a point earlier about how uh, there's a danger involving AI running nuclear systems because of possible radar errors or any other mistakes leading to an unnecessary strike. How is that much different from the status quo where, if I'm not mistaken, there have been such close calls in the past? Yeah, there, there are an alarming number of uh, close calls, strategic miscalculation, nuclear accidents. Um, and I think if you read a book like, uh, say, The Limits of Safety by Scott Sagan that sort of goes through them, the, the one thing that saved us every time was a human being looking at the data and saying, this doesn't make sense. This is not real. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I wanna ensure is always in the loop as a human being. I, I would just say something very quickly too. Uh, when I was assistant secretary, one of the things I was responsible for was nuclear command and control. It is not easy to launch a nuclear weapon. It is not just that the president, no matter who it is, has the idea that he or she can launch a nuke and it happens. There are hundreds of people in a chain that make something like that happen, which is very different, I think, than an AI-enabled decision-making process, for sure. To make some of y'all feel better, too. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm a software engineer. And you mentioned earlier the idea of some defensive technologies, technologies that are easier to use to protect than to do harm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what sort of things those are and where one can find them. Yeah, great question. So yeah, we're really interested in the idea of, of sort of safety engineering or intrinsic security within machine learning systems. I think one really interesting area for research is uh, machine learning on encrypted data. Um, so Microsoft had a piece on uh, sort of crypto nets, um, uh, which is on the archive. Uh, the idea of if you could train a classifier on encrypted data, I mean, not only would that allow it to be privacy preserving, but also it would prevent these kinds of uh, data poisoning attacks uh, that we're concerned about, or the ability to reverse engineer a data set from a model. So these are sometimes called model inversion uh, attacks, um, which is another challenge. If you're training a classifier on some classified data, the classifier then has features of that data, which then really means that the classifier itself is classified. Um, that's awkward, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's awkward if, if you want to get maximum use out of, out of these tools. Um, so secure machine learning, I think, in general, is a really exciting area for a lot of uh, uh, a lot of technical work. Great, right, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Iskander. I'm coming from Kazakhstan. I have a question re with regard to the the chi rising China in the sphere of uh, innovation. Uh, according to the latest data by the National Science Foundation, uh, it said that China is in five, ten years going to become the superpower in uh, key science, key areas in science and innovation. How do you view the future U.S.-China relations in that regard, and what is your opinion on latest issue with regard to the Huawei and uh, the Silicon Valley where Chinese companies are trying to invest? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so, so China uh, has a, um, a well-organized plan for, for AI in particular. Uh, it has an AI development plan uh, that spans multiple years. It has specific milestones. In fact, the most recent uh, policy guidance from China includes things like we want a speech recognition system that's you know 98% accurate, and we want a machine translation system that's 95% accurate, and image classifiers that are 99% accurate. So it it almost reads like a, an IARPA or DARPA program. Like there are these specific <laughs> milestones, specific schedules. Um, and I, I think China has uh, the ability to mobilize. Um, industry, government, academia, all in the same direction. Uh, rather than imitating that, I think, uh, w in the words of Eric Schmidt, we should be more like us, right? So the United States um, leads in AI in part because uh, we have a heterogeneous community of folks who are exploring lots of things that we would not centralize. Um, you know, we would we wouldn't be giving orders to um, to universities to all do the same thing. We wouldn't be giving orders to all of our companies doing the same thing. We have an extraordinary innovation ecosystem that's largely founded on universities. Uh, we have the world's best universities in machine learning and computer science. We should be leveraging that. Um, but we also have extraordinarily innovative companies that have decided to put a large part of their money um, in basic and fundamental research. 
which I think is another advantage that we have. Um, we, we are getting out published in machine learning uh, by China, but if you quality control that publication, if you, if you remove out the sort of self citations, uh, the US leads. I think in order to maintain that lead though, it means we need to continue to invest uh, in what makes us uh, so unique globally, uh, which, which are the, the, the universities as a basis for fundamental research. Great, thank you, that was a good question. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Gene Freuder, I'm an AI researcher. About a right. year ago, Harvard Business Review published an article entitled The Obama Administration's Roadmap for AI Policy, which discussed uh, uh, some reports that the President Obama's uh, executive office published uh, that laid out his plans for the future of AI. So my question is, uh, do those documents, uh, will they continue to have any influence on public policy, or are they dead because President Obama's name is attached to them? Uh, they continue to have an influence, and as, as uh, one of the co-authors of, of that report, I'm happy to see the influence. So the um, National AI R&D Strategic Plan uh, continues to uh, inform investment decisions at the agency level. Um, I was also happy to see uh, that, um, uh, that the recent policy uh, budget guidance from, uh, from the White House uh, has a whole section on AI and machine learning. The national security strategy, I think for the first time, uh, describes the importance of machine learning. Um, so I, I think there is a commitment uh, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, in particular at the White House, uh, to really lead uh, in, in machine learning and to, um, uh, to push investments where, they're, uh, where they matter most. Uh, Michael Kratzios uh, at the OSTP within the White House just had a great interview with the, uh, with the New York Times talking about the importance of fundamental research. Uh, and I think if you look at the NSF investments and IARPA and DARPA and NIST, uh, we're increasing the level of uh, basic and applied research. And I, I'd say both when I was in the Department of Defense and I see on the trajectory, that's only increasing. So some of that, of course, is for purely military type research. But as in a lot of things like GPS, for example, voice recognition technology, maybe the internet, um, there can be <laughs> off spends of that that I think can be helpful too. So, That's right. uh, yes, sir, Hi. please. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Charlie Freifeld, uh, associated with the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I work in quantitative uh, management, investment management at the moment. Um, I want to uh, follow up on some of the things that are already said in question. Um, take, go into the future of say 10 or 15 years and imagine that we have developed artificial intelligence to a tremendous extent way beyond what we have today. Uh, so now you're in the Defense Department and you have a computer that has just analyzed the situation, the military situation. It's taken into account all of the knowledge that everybody has including let's say the Chinese and it tells you that there's a 73 percent probability that China is going to attack in the next week. And right now, the best thing to do is attack China first, right now. And when you query it and say, well, wait a minute, I want to find out how you got that result, it says, well, I did 100 trillion simulations, and that's the net result. And you, you don't have any ability to do 100 trillion simulations and go through that. So it's an old question that Norbert Wiener raised 70 mm -hmm. years ago. What happens when the machine is so smart, you have no idea how it came to its conclusion. Do you rely on its conclusion? What do you do then? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, think we're, I think we've actually sort of had that dilemma for the last several decades. I mean, I at least can't understand um, you know, the, all of the parameters that say a linear regression is simplifying for me. Um, and, and we have had systems that were designed to try to provide sort of um, uh, forecasts of military tension uh, based on you know, regression models. Um, and yet we didn't, um, we didn't abdicate our decision making and say, okay, we should leave it to the model. Um, I think it's very unlikely. Um, I think it's, it's hard for me at least to imagine a period in which, um, in which human decision makers and say nuclear command and control within the United States uh, would defer to a computer model in making a decision about, say, the most consequential uh, military actions that they have to contemplate. 
What do you think, Eric? I, I would totally agree. Even in the hypothetical fact pattern that you gave there, which is pretty compelling, unlikely, but compelling, I can't imagine any Secretary of Defense would ever make a decision based on that, or it would be more than one of 100 data points that that person would take. And there's some things about this that are inherently protective against AI-enabled decisions, which first of all, there's widespread mistrust of intelligence reporting in general in the Pentagon and among policymakers. So <laughs> that's no offense, but it is what it is <laughs> because very often you'll get an Intel report in the president's daily brief and they can't even explain the sourcing for something that came from a human and you may not rely on it, more or less SIGINT or a fancy algorithm. Uh, and th there's just, it seems very unlikely that someone make a, a decision Sorry. as consequential as starting a war with China based on a 73% so, algorithm. So you, you hope the Chinese don't go ahead and do it as a result of their program? You know, I, I can't speak that well for the Chinese, but I bet even the Chinese or the Russians would think twice about starting a war based on an algorithm. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Oliver Regley. I'm a biomedical engineer in the pharma space. Uh, my question is if you're aware of any research into defending against social engineering attacks um, augmented by AI or machine learning, I think we saw in the last election that our, our democracy is kind of vulnerable to these asymmetrical information warfare tactics like targeting swing voters with Facebook ads. So I'm wondering if how we were planning on addressing that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we've funded research uh, on some aspects of, of this topic. Um, uh, one, for example, was looking at uh, sort of how disinformation can propagate within social media networks. Can you predict when something is, is going to take off? Um, another project that we funded looked at detecting um, disinformation edits within Wikipedia. Could you tell when somebody was trying to manipulate a Wikipedia page? Um, and then we also uh, do some work understanding um, censorship patterns or manipulation patterns uh, in news reporting. Um, DARPA has funded a program called Social Media and Strategic Communication looking at detection of chat bots uh, in social media. Uh, and there's a fair amount of, of research sort of at the basic research level of just understanding can you detect when somebody has a disinformation campaign that's centralized. But I think much more research is, is going to be needed and this will be a moving target because the disinformation campaigns will get increasingly sophisticated. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Hi there, my name is Alex. I'm a recent alum of the MIT technology and policy program. And my question is very similar to the gentleman's down there, maybe a bit more generalized. But uh, you recently talked, you talked about how um, you, the explainability of machine learning needs to be key in military, the military context. But at the same time, deep nets are generally not that explainable. So how do you, in the military context, balance this trade-off between explainability and perhaps performance because deep nets are a currently the state of the art in both the context of funding research and deciding what to build in terms of models. Yeah, uh, so we uh, at IARPA, uh, we've had several programs where we require explainability and we're willing to suffer the decrease in performance in order to get it because a tool that's not used by an analyst is non-performing. Um, so even if the, um, if the tool performs well in a technical sense, if it's not trusted by an analyst, it's not going to get used. In those cases, maybe you suffer than the 10% decrease in performance, but if it's explainable, it's going to be much more valuable uh, to the analyst. Um, and I do think there are, there are some, um, some, some really good research efforts now aimed at explaining the behavior of deep neural nets, for example, the explainable AI program uh, by our colleagues at, at, in DARPA, um, and then some work at IARPA that's looking at explaining different classifier outputs in part to detect manipulation. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Dan. I'm an undergrad at Tufts. I study Russian and computational linguistics, and I also work on uh, some IARPA related projects. Um, cool. So my question relates to the education of artificial intelligence, because I see that as a, being a very large roadblock for people like me and other undergrads who are hoping to, like you said, eventually get into this intersection of public policy and artificial intelligence. Um, and right now, at least as far as things seem, there's been a huge push of uh, like people at universities migrating towards the private 
sector uh, where there are just larger financial incentives. There's a lot of talk about how there's a very uh, high demand for deep learning artificial intelligence researchers. However, the supply is fairly minimal given that, like you said, things have only started up six years ago. So, um, and maybe this is more of an education policy oriented question, but how do we incentivize people to, uh, I guess, stick around in the public policy sector mm -hmm. and uh, so that we can continue to foster this sort of artificial intelligence education for uh, future generations? Uh, and what sort of role, I guess, uh, does Arab play in that? Yeah, so it's, it, it can often be hard to compete on salary. Um, so we, we try to appeal to, um, to social service. Um, so the ability to um, influence um, where um, humanity's long-term welfare can be improved, um, the ability to shape a technology such that we're safer and healthier and happier um, as opposed to improving ad hits by 1%. Um, so, uh, and not to put down industry jobs. I mean, I think there's, there's lots of important work that can be done within industry to ensure that the technologies are used uh, to the good of, of humanity. Uh, but but there's, there's nothing like um, working either within NGOs or government agencies or think tanks that help advise the public uh, and government uh, about these important technology issues. The satisfaction that you gain from that, uh, I think, beats the salaries. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. And, you know, I'd just say... Um, Having seen the Department of Defense and the NSA struggle to recruit really high-end cyber talent, the market dynamics are very similar. P pay far outstrips the government. But in that field, when you know you can legally go and hack the Iranians all day long, or in this context, you can take on all of these hard questions that we've been grappling with here, you only do that in government. So come on, y'all, like you can do the right thing. You can contribute to the country, to the world too. You can go work for Facebook later, but make a difference <laughs> now, right? That was your little right. pep talk. Okay, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, could you go ahead? This, this will be our last question because I think I'm getting the hook. So we'll just go right here to you. So much pressure. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, so I, um, I work here and um, I do research primarily on how cities are using AI and predictive analytics. And so one of the things that we are really seeing in terms of um, policy challenge in the field is um, issues around intellectual property. And I was really curious, um, so you know, basically private companies owning algorithms that are deployed by cities, um, and then you know, sometimes the public advocating for algorithmic transparency, right? And so my question for you, I guess, is, um, how, what does the economy of this look like at, in terms of national security mm -hmm. um, and in terms of intellectual property? Uh, so we fund mostly open source software just because um, it's easier to uh, defend. I mean, if, you know, um, uh, with more eyes, all your bugs are shallow, that kind of idea. Um, I do think that, um, uh, that most of the companies that are attracting really the world-class talent and machine learning have also realized that to attract them, uh, they typically need to free up the, uh, the models and the algorithms. The companies treat their data as being proprietary and sort of the secret sauce, but are publishing on the algorithm work. Um, and I think that's something that, um, you know, in general, we also follow. Um, so the intelligence community data is the secret sauce, uh, but we would like for more people to be reviewing the algorithms and improving those algorithms so that they're less errorful. Right. Um, before we wrap up, there's one other person I want to recognize. This is Charles Carruthers, so stand up here, Charles. This is a real live Kennedy School grad who also works in IARPA. He's the Associate Deputy Director at IARPA, uh, helping out Jason here too. So we gotta give him a round of applause because he, <laughs> just like the question posed, he could be making a lot of money someplace else, but he's doing public service and we appreciate that. So thank you very much. He, he's um, done you all proud. Um, and every, every time he goes to a meeting and people find out that he's from the Kennedy School, they're like, okay, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so thank you all very much for coming, giving the time. Jason, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. It was a really thank good you time. all. I really Thanks. Thanks.